I'd like to start by introducing you to our committee. Uh, we, have a, we have a group of people that got together to organize these and worked really, really hard uh, to have this event uh, ready for tonight. So the first uh, uh, person, and, and I'm introducing everyone um, on an alphabetic order. So the first one is Alex, Dr. Alex Hunter, who uh, is our third year resident. Then I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Chris Swayze from the Continuing Education. Uh, we could not have done this without his immense help. We have Dr. DePorter as part of our committee as well. Dr. Uh, Nancy Bowden. We have Dr. Quinn Su. Dr. Vinay Bide and Dr. Bowden Su and, and Bide. They are instructors in our grad pedo program. And, uh, and the last person is me. And of course, I could not be out of this um, amazing team of uh, really great people and hard work working people. We're very thrilled again to have you all here. Would like to, I, I would like to thank our residents who are also very happy to be joining uh, you and, and our seminars tonight. They will be start working very hard moving forward because they will be moderating these sessions. And just before Dr. Lai starts with his lecture, I just wanna go over the list of speakers that we have for the next session. So our goal is to have a speaker presenting every, every two weeks uh, throughout the, the, the end of, until the end of this year. And we're already preparing a list of future speakers for next year as well. So for this year, we have Dr. Light today uh, talking about horizontal guided bone regeneration. Next week, we have Dr. DePorter talking about PRF and CGF in regenerative oral surgical procedures. We have uh, on the November 16th, Dr. Dan Cullum talking about um, membranes, aminion coring allograft uh, membranes for minimally invasive dental implant surgery. We have on November the 30th, Dr. Goldberg talking about uh, peri-implant diseases, diagnosis and management. And on December 14, our last, last lecture of the year will be with Dr. Salah Ways, who will be talking about also desification. Once we have the list of speakers confirmed for next year, we'll be happy to post in our website and we really hope you'll be able to join us for the next sessions as well. So without further ado, uh, I, I would like to introduce Dr. Lai. He actually asked me not to introduce him, but I just wanted to say Dr. Lai is a former uh, director of our program, and he is currently our vice dean of education at, at, at our faculty. So Dr. Lai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Oaks uh, seminar. I want to thank all of you for attending. Hopefully, it'll be an exciting evening. Uh, I understand we have over 350 people registered for this seminar. And I really want to con congratulate Professor Vanessa Mendez and the committee on their hard work in setting this up. Uh, before we get started, I do want to take this opportunity to introduce our dental school and our graduate parent program. So, let me advance this. so University of Toronto was established in 1875. We actually formally began teaching periodontics in 1915, and our graduate specialty program uh, was established in uh, 1950. So this year, we're actually seven, uh, celebrating 70 years of uh, perio specialty training. Uh, my name is Jim Lai. I am a fellow of the Royal College of Dentists of Canada, diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology. I'm also a fellow and diplomat of various other organizations. I'm actually originally from the West Coast. I grew up in uh, Victoria, BC. Uh, but as you can tell, I did most of my formal education at these two institutions. I graduated from University of Pennsylvania and also from University of Toronto. Um, since 2012, I've been a senior academic administrator, starting out as uh, associate dean, and I, I've been uh, vice dean of education now uh, for the last four years. Uh, but what I'm most proud of is I've been uh, fortunate to be the program director of the graduate per periodontal program uh, at UT for the last 15 years. And these are the residents that actually graduated uh, while I was the program director. And we're extremely proud of our program. And uh, one of the reasons why is because we have such excellent pair of residents who went through the program. We, we take great pride in our residents. They're excellent clinicians and strong researchers. Nine of them actually have competed in the American Academy of Pair or Band Research Competition, and four of them in the poster competition. And actually five of them have won the Orban and two of them have won the poster competition. As you can see down the bottom, majority of them are practicing around the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. 
For those that are not familiar with this area, uh, the Great Toronto Hamilton area accounts for maybe about 20% of uh, Canada's population. And the remaining 40% of our residents actually are practiced across Ontario, across Canada, and across the world. And we also actually have among uh, our residents, 13 of them actually have their PhD. 12% of our residents are now professors at various academic institutions. And these are our current residents. Uh, on the top left here, this was the class that just gradu graduated in the summer of 2020. And these are the residents that are being now led by uh, Professor Vanessa Mendez. And so uh, and these, these are our current residents. To give you a little snapshot of our residents, uh, most of them graduate from U of T, but you can see the other half actually graduate in, in many different institutions. 10 of our residents actually um, had at least one year of work experience either through GPR, AEGD, prior practice, but we did accept three directly from the uh, fourth year of dental school after they graduate, immediately after they graduate from dental school. So today I'm, actually, I'm going to talk about um, achieving predictable horizontal guided bone regeneration. And I want to give full credit to the residents. The cases I'm presenting today are all managed and photographed by them. Uh, what I will share with you today are the techniques and approaches that we found to be more predictable uh, with our residents. I know that you have here in continuing education, there are these experts that give their point of view about what technique works well for them. Um, and they're very skilled clinician and um, they work, but I really want to share with you, and we, in our program, we have tried them, and I basically want to share you uh, with the ones that we found to be uh, uh, predictable. And I will also share with you the complications that we have encountered uh, from doing these cases. And hopefully this will help shape how you can approach your guide bone regeneration. Uh, you might hear me use this word sticky bone in CGF. Uh, this was actually, a, 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 it was coined by a Professor Sun from Korea. I'm not going to talk too much about it because that will be uh, part of the topic with uh, Professor DePorter uh, on November the, the 2nd. Uh, just a reminder about, uh, please do not uh, uh, reproduce uh, this lecture or the recording without uh, permission. So let's start talking about bone. Why do we need bone? So simplistically, uh, I think you can appreciate we need enough bone to achieve prime stability. So that way you can actually uh, have the implant uh, uh, to become osteotomic. Uh, but even after osteo integration, we want to make sure that uh, when we restore the implant, it's able to withstand the biomechanical forces. Uh, and thirdly, uh, you want to make sure the, the surface of the implant and the threads are covered. And the most predictable way of ensuring that's covered is having bone covering um, the, the implant surface. In this cartoon diagram, I think you appreciate there's probably not enough bone for us to achieve prime stability, so hence osteo integration would not occur. Um, now, even if it was integrate, I think you can appreciate if we restore this type of implant, it's not going to be able to withstand normal biomechanical forces. And also, you can appreciate the, the roughened surface and threads are all exposed. And there's concern, will that lead to peri-implantitis? Peri so the idea about guided bone regeneration, uh, now, in this, this is a cartoon diagram. Let's assume we got new bone, uh, the orange part. Um, let's say we're able to grow that much bone, and now, the thinking is that new grafted bone, in this scenario, the quality has got to be good enough to give us prime stability. That grafted bone has to be able to integrate around the implant. And even after restored, that grafted bone needs to be able to withstand uh, daily the, the daily biomechanical forces. And third, you want that grafted bone to stay there so that way it can cover, remain covering the exposed, um, or covering up the roughened surface and threads. So, one concern when you're doing bone grafting in the back of your mind, you really have to ask how good is that grafted bone? How long does that bone remain intact? And is it really all new bone? Because we've done uh, histology studies and, and studies have demonstrated that we know after a site that's been grafted, you do get vital new bone, but the other half is actually basically dead, dead bone particles. This is another scenario. In this scenario, it's meant to demonstrate that there is enough bone to give you prime stability. So in other words, you don't need extra bone to give you prime stability in this case. And I would argue maybe even if you restore it, there's enough bone to help you withstand the biomechanical forces. But I think you also can appreciate in this situation, what's not favorable is the implant surface is exposed. So there's a plaque retentive area. 
So if you're if you're to perform grafting over an implant surface, then ideally, you know, if you get the new bone, which is uh, the bottom diagram, that's the orange color. If it works, that's the most ideal scenario. But the challenge is, what happens if you graft the bone and did not work at all? Because there's enough bone there, Austin integration will occur. But now you're stuck with this dilemma. Do you go ahead and restore this implant? Because it has also integrated, but I think you can recognize the disadvantage is there are exposed surfaces and, and roughened implant, uh, uh, and the surface is roughened. And you know, what we're really concerned about these days are, you know, there's definite evidence there's increasing uh, incidence and prevalence of peri-implantitis. So you know, right now they're reporting maybe about at the patient level, 80% uh, prevalence of peri-implantitis, and at the implant level, maybe about 12%. So that's something we want to avoid. So in other words, if we're going to graft bone, we want to make sure that the outcome will have adequate quality and quantity. The graft of, uh, site remains stable, so that way it will actually give you prime stability, withstand ability to withstand biomechanical forces, and remain and, and covering the exposed rough and surface and threads. So let's talk about guided bone regeneration. I think we recognize we want regeneration and not repair. And factors that can interfere with osseous formation. Uh, could involve failure of the blood vessels to proliferate into the wound, improper stabilization of the coagulum granulation tissue, and that may result in ingrowth of non-osseous tissue with high proliferative activity, and, or you could get bacterial contamination. So we recognize when we're doing guided tissue re regeneration around teeth, uh, number one, we're trying to grow three tissue, the cementum, the alveolar bone, and the PDL, is the open uh, wound system, it's really hard to maintain a sterile condition. Uh, it's hard to stabilize the membrane around the tooth. Adapting the membrane is, is difficult, and maintaining the space here is also difficult. So it's not as predictable as compared to guided bone regeneration, because number one, we're only growing one tissue, which is the bone, and we have the ability to actually have a closed system where we completely close the wound. We're able to maintain a sterile condition. There's different ways of how we can stabilize the membrane, we can adapt the membrane, we can maintain the space much easier, and therefore the predictability is, is high. So in terms of you know, what you need for guide bone regeneration is you want to have appropriate barrier memory to exclude the unwanted cells. You need to maintain the space for angiogenesis and osteogenesis. You want to create the space. You want to have appropriate bone grafting material to support the membrane and prevent membrane from collapsing. Uh, you want to uh, properly mobilize everything and prevent any micro-movement or any growth of fibrous implant tissue. So, you know, the classic study was, you know, they demonstrated on, uh, on rats that in the test site, if you have a bone defect, you cover it with Teflon membrane, they demonstrated that the bone heals within six weeks versus the defect that did not have a membrane. There was actually little or no signs of osseous healing after 22 weeks. Uh, how, how how well do implants fare in grafted sites? So these are some studies. You can see the cumulus survival rate uh, is re reasonably high, you know, it's 90% to 100%. Uh, the success rate may be slightly a little bit lower, but and you, you can also see that, that there is a, a, some wide range. Now, I'm not gonna really go into detail specifically about the types of bone graft or membranes we're using. Uh, and we can actually address that at the, at the very end of lecture, you have some, some specific question. But I just want to show this uh, systematic review that actually looked at the, um, uh, the materials that was used. So uh, in terms of what they defined as bone substitute material, they looked at allograft, freeze-dried bone allograft, the mineralized freeze-dried bone allograft, uh, uh, xenografts, and you know, uh, equine hydroxyapatite. So a variety of different types of graft. And really at the very end, they demonstrate the mean uh, implant survival uh, for bone substitute materials, 97.4%. If you mix the bone substitute material with autogenous, it's 100%. And if it's autogenous uh, bone alone, it's 98%. And a lot of people had always considered abuse of autogenous bone to be the gold standard. But this meta-analysis revealed there was no difference in implant survival between using a bone substitute material compared to autogenous bone alone. So quite, we do use autogenous, but obviously, we actually tend to use a, a lot more bone substitute material. Um, the fundamental question I have, as I posted at the beginning, was how stable are these grafted sites? 
And unfortunately, there's not that many good long-term evidence that actually evaluate the three-dimensional shape of the graft of site. It's actually, these studies are quite rare. And this was a systematic review that looked at that. And they did identify only two trials, two randomized controlled trials that lasted from two to five years. Uh, and they did report the, um, uh, the implant survival rate was 92 to 100%. And the margin of bone loss was quite minimal. There's a little more prospective study that had reported outcome from one to 12 years. And they reported the implant survival rate was around 91% to 100%. So what I want to talk about today is what are some key concepts or fundamental knowledge you want to uh, think about when you're performing guided bone regeneration. And I'll go through all these different five steps individually. So the first thing is flat management is so important. You want to create a tension-free closure uh, so to maintain that priming closure. Because we know that um, if you keep it closed, you can maintain that sterile condition and minimize the chance of infection. If there is an incision line opening, which is one of the most common post-operative complications, your graft could get contaminated, vascularization can, can be delayed, and you can lose the, the graft material. So some fundamental principle, you want to try to keep your incision in keratinized tissue, your vertical incision away from the graft site. Uh, you want to make sure you get tension-free closure. Uh, you can use non-resorbable sutures and make sure that, it's not that graft site is not loaded. Now, if you look in some reviews, uh, some people actually have talked about different types of flat design. I'll be honest, I really don't understand all these different ones, but some people have come up with these different names as listed on this list. But basically, the, the most common one that people have used is the periostal release incision. So the typical uh, style that people would do this is you'll, you'll raise a full thickness flap, you'll have two divergent vertical incision, and, uh, how, and how apically do you want to go is you want to try to raise the flap beyond the mucogenic junction and at least five millimeters beyond the bone defect. So you're going quite apical. And then it's only far down, that's where you'll actually start splitting the periosteum. And so for example, this is a case where you can see there's actually exposed threads here. We know that you know, to in order to get primary closure, we're gonna have to put some, some bone on the buckle there, but we wanna make sure we get tension-free closure. So then you know, you're gonna apply tension on the, on the buckle flap, take a new sharp blade, go apically five mils beyond the bony defect, and you're going to uh, uh, split the periosteum. And you see after doing that, we're able to actually get uh, more mobility of the flap. So then you have the ability to pack bone graft and membrane, and you're able to achieve uh, primary closure. But I'll be quite honest. For us, uh, we do, do do that. But what I found with my residents is we were not consistently getting attained primary closure. Maybe they're not aggressive enough. And as a result, you know, using this technique, we're seeing during our post-op visit, uh, opening of the incision line, and then that will result in premature exposure of the membrane and contamination of the graft. So there's this other technique that, uh, for me personally, I have actually liked. It's called the superficial layer split thickness flap. And I personally feel it'll actually have more predictable technique in obtaining primary closure. This technique that was developed by Hank Greenwell, and he published it uh, in, the, in the journal in 2004. And basically, the idea is it will separate the superficial layer of the mucosa epithelium and connective tissue from the underlying layer of the muscle and periosteum. So this is my little cartoon diagram. What you'll do is on the crest, you'll make an incision to the bone, and you're going to raise a full thickness flap and just elevate a little bit beyond the mucogingo junction. Then, just uh, beyond that, that's when you're going to start doing your split thickness flap. So this technique. You're starting your, uh, you're going through the periosteum a lot more coronal than the traditional periosteum, uh, periosteum releasing technique. So you're going to start doing a sharp dissection, and uh, you're going to follow the contour of the mucosa surface. So that the idea is, you can see in this diagram, this is a superficial layer and separating from the underlying muscles and, and the periosteum. Uh, now, uh, when Hank Greenwell developed this technique, obviously the concern was because it's thinner, will that flap slough? you know, will actually necrose and slough off. And he didn't have a problem and we've been doing it and we, we actually have not had that problem. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the traditional technique, uh, compared to the traditional technique, this technique really tries to keep the muscle layer uh, out of the, the flap. So I got a little video to show you. So this is just to demonstrate, you know, if you want to remove excess moisture, you can actually uh, take the uh, surgical suction tip uh, and hold it perpendicular to it. 
So this is the technique. What we've done is we did the two vertical, just about uh, maybe about five mils beyond the mucogingival uh, junction. And then uh, you see uh, the, the flap, there's a little bit of tension. You want to take a new sharp 15 and you want really a light brushing stroke. And a lot of it is tactile sense because you'll feel the periosteum. You'll feel that resistance. So you want to lightly brush it until you break through it. Obviously, you can see here, you have to be really careful because you're doing this a lot more coronal. There is a chance that if you're careless, you could actually accidentally perforate it through to the buckle. And, and that has happened with, with our residents. And I'll show you uh, how we manage that. But right now, you can see in this video, we're, we're slowly just, uh, just lightly brushing it. And eventually, you can see, uh, and here, that, that's what I'm, I'm demonstrating, you can see your, the, the periosteum splitting. And then, and then after that, once you use that, then you want to extend it mesial uh, and distally. You want to connect that. Then now, and I reposition the flap to make sure I'm not going to perforate out, out to the buckle. And then you're going to start slowly doing your sharp dissection, and you're going to slowly work apically. And then I think you can appreciate once you're below the, uh, so I, I'm blobbing this dry just to make sure that there's no perforation on the buckle there. And then uh, you want to go apically, and I think you can appreciate once you've gone in uh, apical to the vestibule, then the chance of perforation is, is less likely. Uh, obviously, the deeper you go, you have to be uh, familiar with all the different uh, anatomy. You want to make sure you're, you're not causing any harm. So the superficial part, you can see as we're extending, and later on, you'll see me also extending my vertical. Uh, but th the first thing is we're just focused on the split fitness flap. And we're slowly, and now I, hopefully you can see that it is actually starting to separate. So you, know, you can appreciate the muscle layer in the periosteum is still bound down to the bone, and this is superficial. So we're slowly extending it. And I'm always applying a little tension on the flap because as you're doing it, you should start to see, feel the flap move. And you're also, uh, you want to feel where it feels bound down. And then with your blade, you want to start to focus on that where, where that, where that is bound down. So now we're, we're, we're advancing a little deeper. I, I'm applying pressure. And I know that in order for me to get mobility, I, now I can feel that the distal aspect is still bound down. So I am actually going to extend my uh, vertical more apically. And also I, I can continue to do my split thickness lap. And now when you're testing the, uh, and now once we're happy with the mobility flap, the deeper area, you're going to raise it like a full thickness flap. So that's taking a periosteal elevator. And we're just going to peel back the, uh, the periosteum. So there's going to be two layers with this. Now, I usually don't do the vertical for the periosteum because that actually forms a nice little pouch that will actually uh, allow you to tuck the membrane in. And also, uh, that, that pouch will actually hold um, the, the bone graft uh, fairly nicely. So obviously, how far do you elevate the deeper layer? is, well, how much bone do you need? You know, and where do you think the apical extend the bone? This is demonstrating how much mobility I have. In order to test for mobility, you cannot retract the lip. You have to release the lip, and then, and then it's by feel. It really has to be tension-free. You can see there is actually quite mobile. I, I'm not putting too much tension on for, for that. So that's just testing the mobility. So I, I'll, I'll have slides later on, but this is near the end. After we raise the flap, we're going to tuck in the, the uh, resorbable membrane deep in. And then now we're actually going to use the um, bone graft to actually also hold that in place. So you see we're uh, focused on packing apically. You see there's a, a lot of uh, uh, fluid, a lot of bleeding in that area, and sometimes it's a little hard to see. So you want to just put your periosteal elevator there and have the assistant actually go uh, perpendicular to it, and that will nicely remove any excess moisture, and then you can actually uh, have better visualization. So this is the other technique, and I got slides showing you how, how we do it later on. Uh, uh, one of the key things I developed was actually uh, the way how we stabilize the membrane. So after we pack the bone graft, you want to um, now gently lay the, the resorbable membrane over the, the graft site. But obviously, as you're manipulating that, you want to make sure that you're not going to pull out the, the resorbable membrane. So you have to do, do this very gently. And in this particular case, the material we're using is actually BioGuide. And you know, as you can appreciate, it can get really sticky. It can stick on the inside of the flap. So you have to very uh, gently uh, uh, manipulate the flap. And I usually like holding a, a con plier in my left hand and, and the uh, uh, periosteal elevator in my right hand. So, uh, so you might say I got three little fingers 
you know, moving this around. And then you can actually slowly, um, uh, you don't have to be that perfect yet because this will move around while we're suturing. So this is a suturing technique. You're actually going, we, we take a monofilament. We, I usually, like, uh, I recommend a monofilament like such as uh, PTFE. You go about five millimeters apical to the wound edge. And uh, you're going to actually do a horizontal mattress suture. So you can see uh, this is actually going to start on the distal aspect. And now you're going to have to go underneath the periosteum. So obviously the higher up you, you do this, the a lot easier because if you, if you start doing a start, uh, uh, sharp dissection, the periosteum is deeper, then it takes a lot more time to dig it out. So you want to actually uh, go underneath the periosteum, grab that. So that's the first part of the horizontal mattress suture. And then now you're going to reposition your, your needle. And now on the meso aspect, on the meso buckle aspect, you're going to uh, grab the periosteum again. So as mentioned, while this is happening, don't worry, your, your bone graft and your, your membrane will be kind of squishing around, moving around. And now the, this is the last part is you can go uh, inside the flap uh, and, uh, and then this is your mattress suture. So now what you do before you tie it, this is your chance to move the membrane, flatten it down again, and also uh, adjust your suturing so that way it's actually lying uh, on top of the membrane properly. So normally I would take the both end of the suture and gently uh, apply a little tension. So it's getting a little snug down, but you don't want to tie it too tight yet. Because you can see sometimes the memory is bunching out a little bit. So you just want to take the, um, the elevator and just kind of manipulate the, the membrane and reposition it. And actually, I, there is some excess bone, so I, I'm removing the excess bone. And then once you're happy, then you can actually uh, uh, apply a little more tension on the, the suture and, and tie the knot. So I mentioned I, I got some slides in that area, so it'll be a, a little bit easier to see. But you'll see when I stitch it down, you know, things will look, look a lot tighter. And I can guarantee this technique, when we're done, you can take your thumb and push on top of the bone graft and nothing moves. It's actually surprisingly quite solid and quite, uh, it really is, is a mobile. So you can see this technique by this horizontal mattress suture, we're gonna bring that periosteum uh, uh, up and over the apical part of your, your bone graft. So I'm just leaning over this, just doing one final position of the suture and I'm going to uh, uh, pull, apply some tension. And then you can see now it's actually going to hold down the, the periosteum. And just, just to be thorough, we just took a CT scan of the surgery. This was the before picture. And this is the typical uh, technique. What we see, you can see that we did gain some uh, additional um, uh, bone graft in, in this area. But I'll talk about how much uh, gain do we get. So we first did this technique in uh, 2010. Uh, and to give you an idea, this patient is missing congenitally missing lateral sizer. I think you appreciate quite often there is a buccal concavity in this area. So what we did was we raised the flap and did that technique. So you can see that's the deeper periosteum and this is a superficial flap. Uh, and then what we did was, uh, in this case, we actually used tax uh, at the apical part of the membrane to actually, uh, you can see that this forms a nice little container for your bone graft to go in. And then uh, we packed up with uh, uh, FDBA, freeze-dried uh, uh, bone allograft. And then, and then that's when I, I decided, I go, well, that's a shame. The reason why we did this was to get the tension-free closure, but I thought, well, it's a shame to just leave the periosteum down there. So that's when I decided to actually, and this is one of the first one we did, I used a resorbable suture. Uh, use this technique to grab it uh, and actually maintain it. And then after that, the superficial part is easy. Once, once this is all nicely bound down, it's not moving, then you actually can uh, close the superficial part. And this is actually how it looked like after the healing. And this is when we raised the flap. Uh, you can see we're quite delighted and you can see that the, the tack is kind of overgrown and we got a uh, uh, pretty good bone, but we had to remove this tack because it was impeding our, our implant placement. So this was the, the outcome after the, the case has been restored. And this is actually um, about four years later. So you can see the bone level is actually still quite good. So I want to compare you know, the traditional technique where on, the, uh, on this side is demonstrate, usually people would actually do the 
where you start releasing the periosteum is like three to four mils apical to an apical part of your graft material. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, Esteban Urban did publish uh, a periosteal suture. Uh, he actually used resorbable suture, and he actually started inside the flap, whereas a horizontal, uh, uh, um, he actually is horizontally. And as, as a result, if you read his uh, techniques, the, the knot is still inside. Um, I think our technique is a little bit more elegant. Um, so Hank Greenwell was the one that did the superficial split thickness flap where our periosteal release decision was more coronal. Uh, I like uh, doing that a lot more coronally. Uh, we really get the tension-free closure. Uh, and in terms of periosteal uh, suturing, I prefer using non-resorbable because in my mind, I kind of want to keep that periosteal maintained uh, high up. If you use resorbable, it loses tensile strength in about five days. So I thought, well, the way how I suture with the knot on the outside, you can actually keep it there for a month, and then after that, is you can easily remove it. You just have to cut the knot that's sticking out on the pallet, and then you just you can remove that suture a month later. So this is actually a probably a little better description to give you an idea. This patient is actually a little bit unique because orthodontically they move. This is the canine. This is the ladder size, or they actually create a whole space uh, for this. So it looks like a significant buckling cavity because of the canine prominence. But based on a CT scan study, this is where we're planning to put the implant. So you can appreciate that the buccal aspect of the implant will be exposed. So what we, as I mentioned, we did two vertical incision. I like doing a little bit beyond the mucogen junction, about five millimeters. I prefer actually keeping it here. A lot of other people actually prefer um, draw, uh, actually doing it here. So as a result, your flap is going to look like this. So when you're corolling position it, you're actually moving this um, uh, margin. So I usually like to avoid involving the margins of, of the adjacent teeth. And I don't have any problems being, this actually is not that close to the graft site. But you can see here as a full thickness flap, and just beyond the mucogen junction, we're going to take a, a, a new 15 and do our sharp dissection. So you can see we're going to go apically. So that's the superficial part up here. And this is demonstrating the mobility of the flap. Then after that, the deeper layer, we're going to take the periosteal layer and peel it back. Uh, you can appreciate the concavity here. And these are the two, two different layers. You got the deeper layer and then the superficial part. Uh, in this case, we use tacks. Uh, this technique, we, we stopped using tack as often, but you know, when we started doing early on, we were using tacks to help uh, engage the apical part. And then we pack it with uh, mineralized uh, allograft. And then again, that suturing technique, is you want to start about five mils apical, and you're going to go in this direction, and as a horizontal master suture, you can go over to the other side, and grab it like that, and then you tie the knot. And as I mentioned, this is really stable. You can take your thumb and push hard, and it's because the apical part, part is being maintained by this periosteum. Uh, and remember how there's a concavity? So you've got the bony walls that's gonna prevent movement of the bone graft here. And, uh, and this uh, uh, superior aspect is being bound down by the, the suture material. And then after that, you, you close it up, and this is how, how it looks like after uh, the, the suturing. We were delighted by this thickness two, two weeks later. But, so we're saying, wow, this, this looks really good. You remember how that, there was a buckle in the cavity? But then, so we went from there to there, but then I wanna show you after, there is continued resorption of the bone graft. So I was like, oh, we're not that thrilled. We were hoping it was still gonna be this thick, but there has been some resorption of the bone graft. But when you look at the CT scan study, if you look, use the TAC as the landmark, we did get additional bone graft, okay? And, and that's all we really need. You know, we, we're, that actually gave us enough uh, uh, bones for us to place an implant without preferring, uh, preferring it out at the apex, okay? But this is something I'm gonna be talking about later on. What we just did was we grew bone within the envelope bone. We did, we did not grow bone outside the envelope bone. So the space making aspect was just this part, okay? And I'm gonna talk more about like, that later on. But also you have to understand when we compare particulate grafting, uh, the mean volume reduction is about 12% compared to block grafting is about 7%, okay? So uh, using particular grafting causes greater resorption compared to block grafting. As I mentioned, there are complications with the superficial flap. So this is a case that was done by residents. You can see it was a nice uh, deep layer, but unfortunately there was perforation uh, on the superficial part. And in this case, we were doing a Ramus graft. But again, you can simply, we're using particular grafting and then we're using the periosteal suturing to suture down the periosteum. But then you can see that they use resorbable sutures and also uh, tissue glue, histocryl, 
to close the perforation that was caused in, in these two areas. But I want to show you what happens as things heal. So this is two weeks post-op, four weeks post-op, six weeks post-op. So you can see there's you know, thinning of the, uh, the, the tissue up here. Uh, nine week post-op, five months, and six months. So you can see it's, there's actually a, a fenestration. It's not healing well. And so I, so I say, you know, we got to get this closed. So what we did was we anesthetized patient, removed the screws that we could get access to, and we took a round burn to actually remove the, any excess bone that's sticking out so that we, uh, this area can heal by secondary intention. And this is actually at the time of implant surgery. You can see the, the block graft did work. Uh, and then they, they were able to place two nice implants. They then decided to regraft the area, place a, a membrane, and close that over. And then this is the healing afterwards. And afterwards, at the very end, this is actually the, uh, how it looks like after the store. And you can see at least the perforation heal nicely. But obviously, that was a complication. So let me show you another case that a similar thing when we actually had perforation. But this is what we're doing now to manage the perforation. Um, so again, they're doing a split thickness flap. And again, this, we, we're doing a block graft in this case. And we put resorbed membrane. But to fix the perforation, we did the same thing. We sutured the, the perforation, used uh, tissue adhesive. But then also underneath the flap, we placed uh, uh, the porcine collagen matrix. This is what you see. This is actually the, the graph is uh, sluts off. And this is actually the, the, the uh, porcine collagen matrix that you're seeing. And you can see it's actually growing quite nicely. This is, so this is actually one week post-op. This is four weeks. And then actually six weeks, you actually get a fairly nice appearance. And then this is actually how it looked like after we um, uh, are uh, placing the implants. And so we, we, we got a fairly decent result. So how do we stabilize the bone graft? So one option, you can use the tax, but it is very technique sensitive, uh, what we found. So this is a case where we're, we're actually uh, using tacks to stabilize the membrane. Uh, so you can see here, there is a, 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 a buccal deficiency. So you can see here, we're using tacks. But if you look at my residents, first of all, we, we, I find my residents have a lot of difficulty placing tacks, especially in the mandible, because the bone is so hard. You know, you try and put the tack in, it's not going all the way in. And also at the very end, you can see this membrane is not taut. It's actually a little bit loose. So maybe they could have packed more bone graft underneath. Um, but this is actually, uh, and this is how they, they got closure. Um, and this is the one week post-op of healing, two weeks. And then six months later, because there's lack of keratinized tissue, they decided to do a free ginger graft. And then this is how it looks like. But this is the CT scan to give you an idea. You can see the tacks are still here. Uh, and they did get additional bone again. You know, it's that typical appearance that we were, were seeing with this uh, area. And then, so this is actually, uh, we had to drill out the, the tax and then we pop off the, the remain tax. And this is actually how it looked like afterwards. And this is the case when it's fully restored, okay? Now, something about the um, uh, dense, uh, so, so you can see here, there are sometimes, now this case which I'm showing you is not a GBR. It's actually used dense uh, PTFE, uh, like so for example, cytoplasm membrane. And this was used for rich preservation. The people that use this for rich preservation, we know a common appearance is tissue never grows over the exposed membrane. Uh, if anything, sometimes there's a tissue dieback. But we know that usually after 68 weeks, when we pull this membrane out, there's nice soft tissue that has grown, grown underneath it. So sometimes, and as I say, this is a rich preservation, but there are sometimes that we use the non resorbable uh, membrane and we use tacks, and, and this membrane gets exposed. Uh, sometimes I had wished the resident didn't put tax in because, you know, we, we know if you didn't have tax, you could easily have pulled out the membrane and then allow soft tissue to grow over. But because there was tax in that area, then eventually you're going to have to do surgery. You're going to have to actually raise the flap to pop off the tack in order to remove the membrane. So there's some disadvantage about using tax. Uh, and obviously, if you have any exposure of this, if you use titanium, you're going to have to raise the flap no matter what. So uh, the use of tax, it is very useful. But as I, our experience with our, our resident, it actually is very technique sensitive. If it's not done properly, then the membrane might not be taut or might be too loose. Sometimes the membrane might tear. And you may have to raise a flap if there's a membrane exposure to remove the tax so you can remove the membrane. So I actually personally like using my technique where I'm suturing the periosteum. Uh, I think it's much cleaner. You don't need to use the tax, and it's very effective at stabilizing this area uh, for that. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you going away thinking I'm anti-tax. We do use tax, but there's an appropriate time place for the use of tax. But I, I want you to think about using the periodic suit train because it might reduce the need for tax. And you want to be comfortable with all the alternatives. In other words, you want to have more tools in your uh, toolkit. So concept three is a really important concept, is know your limit. How much bone can you really grow? So studies have demonstrated, if you use partitic grafting, the most amount of bone you get is maybe on average 2.6 millimeters. So that might be okay. So let's say if your initial, initial ridge width was four, mil, uh, four millimeters, and you're thinking of uh, putting a four mil wide implant, so let's say normally you want at least a millimeter buccal bone, a millilingual bone. So you're going to need about six millimeters uh, of, uh, so you need additional two more millimeters of bone gain in order to place a four mil wide implant. So this might be appropriate. If your original width is four millimeters buccal lingually, and you say, I just need more two more millimeters, then I think a particular grafting is appropriate. But however, you want to have a know your limit. If let's say the buccal lingual ridge width is Two millimeter, two millimeters. You need to appreciate that it's unlikely you're going to get four millimeters on a regular basis. So po possibly particular grafting is not the appropriate choice for a thinner ridge. So this is the kind of appearance in our technique that we've been using. We've been routinely predictably getting this amount of bone because it's space making fill, and we get on average about two point six millimeters of bone gain. If you need a little more, then you're probably going to have to consider using block graft because studies have demonstrated the mean gain and ridge width with a block grafting is about four millimeters. Okay? So again, there's another study that demonstrate that with partitic grafting, the linear bone gain was 3.31. You do get more bone gain if you're using a block graft. Okay? So as you can appreciate, there's a deficiency. This is a, one of our uh, Ramus graft, and you can predictably get this bone here. And uh, the other thing I can talk about, you can see there's going to be bone growing outside the envelope of bone. So uh, you have to choose is a particular grafting is appropriate or uh, autogenous block is, is more appropriate. So this is actually one of our more successful cases. In this case, we are using a block allograft, not a autogenous block, but a block allograft. You see this patient actually has quite a, a rich deficiency. This is where I, our ideal placement of the implant, which is pretty much block bone on the implant ridge. So in this case, we actually um, decided, I, I apologize for the helicopters landing in the hospital this morning. Um, so you can see we, we use two block allograft. We use fixation screws to pull them in. And we packed it with particular grafting. Again, you can see my uh, periostal suturing technique. And we got pretty good closure after that. And this is the healing afterwards. And, and unlike how that first case I showed you with the canine and the lateral, you know, we were grafting in between that. We got a lot of resorption. But this is the healing afterwards. And because of the block graft, we actually did not get, get much resorption of the, the bone graft. So this is a CT scan study. You can appreciate the additional amount of graft we had. You can use the fixation screw as a, as a guide. Um, and you can even see this additional bone wasn't from the block graft. This was from the partitic grafting, and the block graft was, was down here. So this is actually how, that, that's the, how, how much additional ridge we, we actually have obtained. And this is how, how it looks like uh, when we elevate the flap. So that was the before picture, and this is the this screw correlates to the screw. So we had to take a drill and kind of remove all the, the bones that, that's deeper down. And then we, we go ahead and we're, we're placing our implants. And this is actually five years uh, post insertion. Um, successful block allograft, uh, there's, only, there's really only about 23 studies. Uh, this paper was published in 2016. Overall, you know, with block allogenic graft, you know, you show a reasonable survival, implant survival success rate but there is a lack of controlled clinical trials, so uh, definitive consensus cannot be reached in comparing whether using autogenous versus a uh, uh, block allograft. Uh, the fourth concept is what I was talking about growing bone inside or outside of the envelope of bone. So if you can appreciate that if there's a buccal concavity here and you just want bone to grow within the envelope of bone, then probably particular grafting is adequate. But if I'm thinking I need bone to grow way out here, outside the envelope of bone, then possibly particular grafting is not uh, appropriate. Or if you're going to use particular grafting, then you may want to use a titanium reinforced membrane or maybe using a block graft. So you can appreciate you need, if, the, if there's nothing to maintain the space, bone will never grow in this area. You want to do something to actually maintain the space. So as I say, you know, if you put a membrane over this, this will maintain the space. So this one, I showed this uh, case to you a little bit earlier. I kind of lied because 
I'll show you the outcome of this graph. It did not work because the problem was the implants were way too out of the buckle housing. So upon elevation, you know, this was before where we quote in theory grafted, you can tell the bone graft did not work at all, you know, because we were expecting the particular grafting to grow outside the MLA of bone. And, and you saw even more bone was lost because of the buckle elevation of these implants. So that did not work. But if you're thinking about using particular grafting and you're hoping to get bone outside the envelope bone, then you should probably consider using the titanium uh, reinforced membrane. I'm showing this case because we actually end up fracturing the bone when we're trying to place the tack. So you see we're going to elevate the flap. You see there's uh, quite a bit of buckle depression in this area. Uh, and that's where, that's where we're hoping to put, put, place the implant. And this is, a, you know, we, we, we did the, the split thickness flap. This is actually demonstrating we were trying, we're going to use the tack, but we actually end up cracking this. This is actually into the nose. This is because we're so close to the nasal cavity. So what we did was we gently just popped this bone back out. You know, we left the bone in place. It's still bound down underneath. Uh, so we, we packed it with a uh, bone graft. Uh, this is a titanium reinforced membrane. Again, you can see this is the periosteal suturing. And then we actually put a, some bio guide on the outside. We did CGF and we closed everything up. And this is actually the one we post op six week post-op, and this is actually a CT scan uh, uh, after the deal. And you can see we actually were able to maintain, uh, get some addition ridge width, and this is actually the amount of, uh, in, uh, amount of bone. Now I'm showing this, I don't wanna mislead you because this is more than the, this particular graphing is more than 2.6 millimeters of uh, bone gain, but it is possible to get this, but I wanna say, I don't wanna mislead you by saying this is always this is gonna be the outcome. So, and then this is actually at the time of implant placement, that's the membrane. We removed the membrane, you see the, the bone underneath. We're able to get some additional width. We're able to place the membrane, and it's actually just in the process of being restored right now. Uh, but let me show you another case that has worked out well. So, this one, you, you, want, you want to pay attention to this little height of bone. I think that that was the saving grace with, with this little height of bone. So, I was not getting vertical bone gain we were actually going to get a uh, uh, horizontal uh, uh, width. Uh, if you're using this, uh, the K-Wood Howell class four, where it's a knife edge ridge and there's actually adequate height, but inadequate width. So we actually used the titanium reinforced membrane and this is all that bone we got. When, when, when my residents showed this, I said, we'll see if it's really good bone or not. You know, because it might look good on a radiograph, but if we raise it in a soft bone, then, then that's not gonna be enough. But here actually how it looks like after we raise the flat and turn out was really nice hard bone. So we were able to, to place the implants. And the reason we, there was a mental frame in here. So that's why we just completely avoided that. Um, so again, we're, we're demonstrating, you know, we're, we're using the dense PTFE. And I know a lot of classic studies were looking at the ePTFE. And this is some studies to demonstrate that there's no difference. You got a similar outcome with using dePTFE. Uh, but I want to be realistic. It's again, it's the fundamental concept you have to think about. So in this case, again, we're, we did the split thickness flap, use a titanium reinforced membrane, but unlike the other one, there wasn't that height. So in this case, we're hoping to get some height as a, a class five defect, but, and, and they were actually extracting the force seven at the same time. So realistically, the ability to get good priming closure, the, real, the ability to get a vertical a GBR, if it's not planned up properly, you know, as I say, this is what will happen. You can see I got a nice radiograph of my membrane and a little, you can tell it did not work at, at, at all. And actually there was an infection in that area. So the, the last concept I want to talk about is, should you actually graft the bone first or do you try to simultaneously place an implant and graft at the same time? So this is a case, now I'll be quite honest, this ridge is maybe a little too thin to do, split, uh, to do a split ridge. But what we did, as you can see, you split the ridge, we expanded the ridge, and you can uh, appreciate the whole buckle plate cracked off. Maybe this is a little bit more uh, buckly place. This had, there's a green stick fracture here. But we, uh, and, and so I just want to mention the way how we, I didn't really talk about the lingual flap, but we, there are ways of how we manage the lingual flap. It's either, most of the time, often, we'll just simply brush the, with the back end of the convex end of the mole elevator to stretch the periosteum, awesome, brushing the flap. If you want more mobility, then you'll have to elevate deeper down to my Ohio line and then do a blunt dissection to separate, uh, uh, to detach the muscular insertion from, from the flap. But in this case, we did that both, you know, we released the lingual flap and also the buckle 
Uh, we use sticky bone, CGF, and we close everything up. And then this actually kind of worked. You know, like I got, you can see that you got new bone, and this is the implant here because we did simultaneous implant placement and bone grafting. And this is the before picture, this is the after picture. I got another view. So looks like it happened here. The best result is probably the middle implant. But here I go, I didn't get complete defect fill. You know, I, I, you might say that might be acceptable because, um, uh, you know, non-platform switching implants, you do get bone loss down below the first thread anyways. Here, I was really worried. I really don't know if there's any bone covering that implant surface. I told residents, just don't touch that. I don't want you to scrape off anything. But this is the, our dilemma. If you simultaneously put an implant in and graft at the same time and integrate, what do you do at this point? If you're not thrilled about the outcome, do you now say, well, let's take everything out and graft everything again? But then the patient might ask, so, well, do I have to pay for this extra procedure? And I go, if you're doing that, then why didn't you do, just do that in the first place? Uh, but this case it integrated, so we went ahead and restored it. But I'll be quite honest, long term wise, I am going to be worried about um, this, uh, uh, this implant long term. Here's another case uh, to demonstrate how poorly things can go. So, again, it, th this ridge was too thin to be split, but we, we split the ridge, grab, I placed the implant, placed sticky bone, CGF, closed everything out. But you can see the implant's already exposed two weeks later. And this is eight months later. Like a typical periodontist will say, well, you got brush better. <laughs> you you got to make sure there's no plaque around this implant and around teeth. So he did brush better, but it's not going to help the situation. And this is how it looks like. Obviously, with that tremendous amount of bone loss, we're not going to tell the patient to go ahead and apply the rest of the ridge. Our recommendation is this is how it looked like one year. And the patient was actually quite uh, was easy going. We actually took out the implant and we gave the patient a non implant solution. All right. Uh, I don't want to mislead you. Uh, you know, these two cases were not that great outcome with a, a split ridge. Studies have demonstrated that uh, in cases that worked, you, know, you do get a good implant survival rate and success rate. But definitely, you want to have a minimum of three mils ridge width for you to, before you uh, do a ridge splitting uh, procedure. And I think the two cases that we showed you, it was less than three millimeters. And the final thing is, what do you do when you have the hisses or a fenestration type of defect? Um, Studies have demonstrated that if you put an implant in and you graft it, the mean de defect resolution is 81%. And there are biological complications that occurs about 20% of the time. So my concern is if I'm grafting this, I want 100% defect fill. But studies have reported that normally you'll only get, you'll get 90% defect fill. So I'm worried about what's the remaining 10% if I don't get complete defect fill. So how often do you get complete defect fill? Not that often. I mean, it's like 68% of the time. I don't want to deal with uh, like 30, oh, let's say, let's round this up to 70%. So in other words, 30% of the time, you might get this. I don't want to deal with the situation 30% of the time. Uh, so this is going back to my original cartoon diagram and saying, you know, what do you, if, if you graph simultaneously at the time of implant placement, it works, that's great. But what do you do if it doesn't work? You're stuck with this dilemma because we're worried about potential peri-implantitis. So let me show you another one. You can see this ridge was probably not ideal. There was already a defect. This is a soft tissue defect, but the implant was placed. See, we, we did the superficial split thing and slap, uh, placed the implant, grafted it, but now this time instead of membrane, we decided to use this titanium mesh. Uh, we did put a membrane over it. We did the periosteal uh, suturing. Uh, we did not do stage two. You could maybe argue we should have done the, uh, uh, completely close the flap. And then this actually looked like two weeks later, five weeks later, so already the mesh is exposed. So we have to take out the mesh. So that's how, how it looked like. But now surprisingly, this is how it looked like two years later. It, actually, it looks actually quite healthy because we, we end up putting another implant beside it. But this is a two year uh, post insertion. So this was a study where they placed the implant and there was a dehiscence. Uh, they compared a site that they did graft it, and that site that just left it all alone without any treatment. And really at the very end, and I'm just going to jump to the end, is that they found that the site that was left alone, obviously you had a little more bone loss, and you had more, uh, less bone loss with the site that had bone graft, which made a lot of sense. But in terms of implant survival, it was actually a, fair, a slightly similar outcome. Um, so, that's the concern I have is with exposed thread, what will, uh, what will, will this lead to long-term outcome? And the other thing that you have to think about is that uh, people say, well, why don't you graft again? But my rationale is if you grafted the first time, it did not work, 
what makes you think the second time around the grafting will, will work? This is what we're worried about is, you know, are we going to get progressive uh, uh, bone loss due to pairing? Okay. So I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just aware of the time. Uh, so I'm just going to skip ahead. So the problem is we recognize it's, it's really difficult to manage periamplantitis. Maybe we're better off to do a ridge augmentation first, ensure the bone has healed before the implant placement. That's a little bit better control. Okay. So additional consideration is a common mistake sometimes after you grafted this bone. So you got a nice bone graft here. You're using a drill. You're creating a nice sharp uh, 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 with a drill. You're creating a, a hole, but you have to wear when you're putting it, the implant in. The purpose of the implant is, is the osteotomy site. The hole is smaller than the actual implant. So when you put the implant in, you're expecting the bone to expand. But if you have the buccal aspect is the grafted bone and the lingual aspect is the native bone, which bone is harder? It's the, it's the graft, uh, sorry, the, it's the lingual bone that's harder. And so when you're putting an implant in and your the implant's trying to expand a little more, uh, it's going to more have a tendency to go to the wards to buckle. So, so, so you have to anticipate that. Sometimes we might go back in with our last drill and, and remove a little more bone on the lingual aspect to give us a little more running room because I've had residents where the bone graft worked wonderfully, but when they put the implant in, the, they blew out the whole buckle plate because as they were putting the implant in, it was trying to expand and not realizing that, you know, the bone was softer on the buckle, it just actually moved towards the buckle. Okay. Block grafting is completely opposite. When a block graft works, it's actually really dense cortical bone. So you, you might, there's not, you are not, you're not going to expect too much expansion from the dense block graft. So you might also have to use the dense drill bone protocol because if you don't, sometimes if there's not enough healing, you might actually uh, risk delaminating that uh, block graft. So these are some additional consideration. I'm not going to spend too much time on bone decortication. There's basically mixed evidence. They really question whether uh, there's value of the uh, bone um, decortication. Okay. Uh, I do want to just finish one last one up for wound healing complication. This was the consensus report from the European workshop on, uh, para, uh, on, on bone regeneration. They reported that the most frequent uh, uh, complication was wound dehiscence, memory exposure, graph exposure, and I think I, we showed you some of that cases. Uh, less frequent complication could include infection, paresthesia, and swelling, okay? So this is actually one, to, we actually did end up demonstrating the mental nerve. So you can see we're putting the implant in the anterior area. Uh, we did a block, uh, block grafting, and again, particular grafting with suture with periosteum. But uh, this is where the mental uh, foramen was, and the verticals were quite well away from the mental foramen. But uh, we were, this one, my resident didn't use a split thickness lab. They were doing the periosteal elastic technique, where it was the, you split the periosteal apically and you brush it up. But uh, two things is, it's always important to see what you're doing. My resident admitted he wished that he did a better, uh, there's a better job of suctioning to make sure that there's, there, uh, the blood is removed and was a little too aggressive with separating the elastic fibers because what happened is uh, he ended up cutting the, the mental um, nerve. So I can come back to that in a moment. So you can see this is the closure. It did heal, but then again, let me show you an additional complication. I show you all these other block grafting we had. Unfortunately, this patient, not only the mental nerve was damaged, um, you can see that the actual, the corona aspect of the block graft se sequestered out. Um, so this case, I actually personally took over. I worked closely with the patient because, you know, patient has been through a lot. And this is actually how it looks like at the time of implant placement. And at least we're able to get the, the two implants in. Uh, and so you can see there's actually, uh, even though there, there's a question on the block graph, they did work at both sites and were able to place two implants. But just to give an idea, uh, when the mental nerve exit the mental foramen, there are actually four branches, okay? And they do, when they branch out, they're inside um, the, the lip here. And this probably gives you, and this is uh, to give you an example, my residents probably cut this uh, anterior branch of the mental nerve. So you have to be real careful that it will go into soft tissue. And you, even though you might think anterior is a safe zone, you do really have to be careful because uh, uh, he did end up actually cutting the, the, the memory. And one last thing is the para, uh, memory exposure. You see there's a, there is a buccal defect. They're going to take out this tooth. So again, they, this one used uh, uh, a titanium reinforced membrane, grafted air, in all that site. And you can see this is how it looked like six months later. And you can see, sometimes I can't help th thinking, is it, is it because we use a non-resorbent membrane and, uh, um, and it's stiff 
and you have these uh, areas that may be more prone to, to it. The second thing which I'm not gonna talk about is actually this person turned out to be an uncontrolled um, diabetic, had high glycemic control. So that might have contributed to that. But what we had to do is obviously you had to get primary closure for this. So they raised the flap, they actually uh, placed a, a, a porcine collagen matrix in that area to repair the area. Remember how I showed you early on, we used that to repair the perforation. And again, you can see this is actually that similar appearance that we're seeing. One week post-op, this is how it looks like three week post-op. And then this is actually how, how it looks like se uh, seven week post-op. And this is actually, luckily, the, despite that, that big mem membrane exposure, looks like the bone graft actually has worked. So this is actually some, uh, the CT scan to demonstrate that we did get some, some bone gain in, in this area. But it is technique sensitive. And this paper actually discussed about GBR is very technique sensi sensitive. Uh, it may be regarded as the main component to avoid soft tissue complication. So definitely your surgical skill is really important. You have to be uh, really good with manipulating the flap. And also, uh, it is expected that careful execution of an elaborate clinical technique may be the key in reducing the number and severity of, of complication. Considering the incident severity of complication, you may, it, it does impose a burden on the patient. Like for example, the one that I showed you where she actually had her nerve damage and the bone, bone graft sequestered. You really want to consider treatment option, are there any alternatives? Maybe the patient might be better than other than doing GBR. And, and so you need to carefully value that. Like for example, this one, you know, obviously hindsight is, uh, is, is beneficial, but I'm looking at, they were grafting this to build this up, but I'm looking at the amount of ridge width, it looks like that's enough to put an implant here. And if they were thinking about extracting this lab incisor, and you do ridge preservation, there's a good chance you could put another implant in. So I, I question, well, do we really need to graft this area and, and put this patient through that where you have the exposure of, of the membrane? So the, the issue is uh, GBR is a wonderful technique. Uh, you know, I really enjoy working with my residents with that. Uh, but you want to really have an ex, uh, uh, expectation about the predictability of GBR. What you want to do is ensure you want to minimize the com complication. Uh, you, you need to be realistic of how much additional bone you, you will gain from that and how often can you particularly achieve uh, this, this result. So hopefully today, tonight, you, you at least got some idea about primary closure, how you get tension-free flap. For us, we, we like using the superficial split thickness flap, uh, considering using how, how do you stabilize the bone graft membrane, considering utilizing the, the periosteum, the way how we suture it. Know your limit, know how much bone you need, and then that will help you decide should I just use partic grafting or partic grafting with a titanium reinforced membrane or use a block graft. And that's also uh, going to dictate are you thinking about growing bone inside or outside of the envelope bone. And also it's really important, think about do you rush everything, try to do simultaneous implant placement and graft at the same time. Don't get me wrong, we do do those, uh, but also, but you want to consider other alternative, maybe it's more predictable to do one miracle at a time. So you do the augmentation first, let that heal properly, and then you place the implant. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you guys listening in. Uh, and I believe that uh, my residents will take over. They're going, if there's any questions uh, for me or if they have any questions. So I will stop the screen sharing for the moment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lai, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we're going to ask some questions now from our audience. Uh, just a reminder that if you do have any questions, you're welcome to send them via the chat to the moderator. So the first question here is, what are your thoughts or opinions on cortical perforations during the GBR procedure? So we, we actually do do it. And, and um, so, but, but you're asking, we're, we're not consistent. You know, there are times we'll do it and other times we don't do it. And even the times we don't do it, it'll work out. So um, I, I have no problems doing it. You know, but I'll be honest with the evidence, it's not like convincing evidence, but um, you might say that's where we're a little bit consistent. For me personally, uh, you, you might say, and this is not, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, this is not gonna be evidence-based, but um, uh, for me personally, if I look at the bone and I think it's actually it looks really cortical, then I'll go in and, and uh, do some cortication. And, and I'm not, I, I'm making small holes. We're not making big 
uh, holes. It, it's actually, I, I was someone just take a, a precision drill and go in a, a little bit for, uh, for, for that. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Lai. Um, the next question uh, was, uh, with the horizontal mattress suture that you place, um, are you worried about putting pressure on that bone graft, uh, the particular graft that you had? Actually, not really, because the reason why is, uh, you think about the, and this is the, usually the, why we do this is because it's the um, uh, 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 space making defect. So you, you do have the, the walls on the adjacent side supporting your membrane. And, and the bone graft, we, we do pack it in, not, not like really hard, hard packing in, but it's actually quite solid. And, and that's why even after we suturing, if I put a lot of pressure, it doesn't move. So in other words, the amount of uh, bone graft you have is going to dictate by simply how much bone graft you have. So even that horizontal periosteal suturing, it's not going to put a whole lot of pressure because it's actually uh, that bone graft underneath, that's what's uh, maintaining the, the volume of, of that. And, you know, and the, the only purpose, and, and, it's not, and you, if you think about it, the only real reason why we're doing that is you just want that uh, periosteal suture to apply to keep the membrane from slipping out, you know, it's actually applying uh, pressure on that. And and as I say, we usually will remove it within two to four weeks, anyway. So th there, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of pressure. It doesn't make a big impact on that. All right, thank you. And the next question is: Would the would the superficial split layer technique be appropriate in the posterior mandible? Yes, and, and so, so first of all, you have to understand posterior mandible, no matter which technique you do, it's very difficult because uh, often there's a, a lack of uh, vestibule and you know, usually I find the, the mandibular muscles are much more stronger. But we, we do do that. Like, so for example, I know if you remember, uh, the, the case I showed with a really thin ridge, um, that's what we did. But obviously you have to be very careful with the mental nerve. So that's the only one. It's really right over the mental nerve we don't want to go that deep. And so that's the only one that inhibits that. So sometimes you might rely more on um, also, you know, uh, releasing your, your, uh, your lingual flap to get a little more, more, more mo mo uh, mobility for that. Okay, thanks. Uh, next one is, so when growing bone outside the envelope of bone, do you always opt for a Taj block on lay graft harvesting? Or can you get predictable results from a bone substitute? Yep. So, so for well, as I say, one example I showed was the bone allograft. So um, uh, now, I think we're quite comfortable using the bone allograft in the maxilla, not so much in the mandible. The problem with the bone allograft, once it gets exposed, tissue never grows over it, and and um, and because you got the fixation screw in that area, once it because it's dead bone, so. It just stays there, and, and, and actually, usually when we if we do expose get exposure, you try and remove it. Uh, you end up removing most of that block allograft because because your, your fixation fixation screw is just holding on to the, the dead bone particles. So um, to answer your question, is that yes, most of the cases we we showed, and most of the cases we do are autogenous block graft, but uh, block allograft is an alternative. Don't quote me on this. Something that we're looking at and exploring. You know, we've done one or two cases using tooth graft. Uh, there's also, um, uh, we haven't not done any cases, but you know, you know uh, there are bone rings out there now. We haven't had any experience with those. Um, but uh, you might say actually to tell the truth, there's two ways of looking at it. I, I really feel we don't do as many block grafting anymore. It depends on where you're at because, because these days I found, number one, hopefully, Oral surgery departments are not teaching dental students when they're extracting tooth to compress the buccal lingual bone now anymore. I think that's one of the reasons why we got all these little skinny ridges is because back then we were after tooth extraction, we we're compressing buccal lingual bone. Um, number two is because the people are aware about implants, they're actually um, um, aware of it. So as a result, uh, we're at the time of extraction, we're doing ridge preservation. So realistically, I see less and less ridges that are very severely resorbed that you need the block grafting. Lots of times, maybe just a particular grafting will work. But to answer the, the original question is, yeah, most often we do still use autogenous block grafting, 
the maxilla, I, I would be comfortable using the block allograft. Okay, this was our last question. Thank you very much, Dr. Lai, for the great presentation. Thank you, Holly, Sean, and Lelia for uh, moderating the session tonight. I'd also like to thank our participants today. We had uh, at some point almost 180 participants. And I'd like to, to invite you to join us uh, next week with doc for Dr. DePorter's lecture and to continue joining us um, for our future sessions uh, that are coming up um, in the subsequent weeks as well. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. And I hope to see you all next week again. Thank you.